Um, I'm now handing over to, uh, so my pleasure is to hand over to Luca Ferretti. He is at um, Oxford Big Data Institute and also currently advisor for the uh, Italian government in the current crisis. And yes, uh, we're happy to have you, Luca. Uh, please, uh, the stage is yours. Luca, we can't hear you. Maybe you're muted. We see the slides. Um, yes, now we hear you, I think. No. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Great. Uh, sorry, is that every time I use this, uh, the mouse disappears. Not, don't know why. Uh, anyway, my talk uh, is a slightly probably different one from the others because I'm going to discuss mostly about epidemiology of this virus. And especially I'm going to discuss our work uh, about uh, how we quantify the dynamics of the transmission of, uh, of, of this uh, disease and what are the implications in terms of epidemic control and contact tracing. So, uh, let me first emphasize that uh, essentially some measures for, cont for epidemic control are inevitable. This is the celebrated plot uh, by, by Imperial College showing that uh, at least in the UK and in the US, uh, there is no chance uh, but to have some uh, effective measures of epidemic control that could greatly reduce uh, our not uh, for the virus in, way in one way or another. And all the, say, moderate measures are not gonna to work and are gonna um, have a far larger impact on uh, healthcare systems than acceptable. So the key point is that the virus should be stopped in terms of a great reduction of its R0. Now, how, it's, how this, can this reduction be done? Well, that, this question implies uh, some understanding on how the virus spreads, because if, if we want to block spreading, it's crucial to understand what are the different ways. We propose an epidemiological classification. It's not really a physical one, but it's epidemiological because, of course, we want to talk about epidemiological interventions. In terms of four categories, one is symptomatic, direct or indirect infection from individuals that have already shown some symptoms. The other one is pre-symptomatic, that is a direct or indirect infection from individuals that will show symptoms in the future, but they are, they are still, uh, they are infectious right now, but they don't know that they are infected. Then there are individuals that are fully asymptomatic. There appears that there is some, some, some faction of individuals that never develop symptoms, but nevertheless, they are infectious. And then there is environmental one. And by environmental, we mean delayed one. So trophomites and uh, our ventilation system in such a way that you cannot really trace uh, who infected you. Now, we started this work uh, thinking that asymptomatic and environmental transmission would have a great impact uh, on uh, the spread of the virus because of some early reports that most infections uh, were essentially untraceable. However, it became uh, apparent with time that uh, although there is a lot of uncertainty on these quantities, it's not apparent that they contribute in a dominant way to the spread of the virus. Asymptomatic people can be quite frequent maybe even up to 40, 50%, but they seem to have a lower infectiousness. So although their number can be large, their contribution to transmission could be relatively moderate. Uh, and about environmental transmission, there is a lot of uncertainty, but uh, indirect environmental transmission, let's say four mites that, that, that then get, um, get uh, um, uh, get on and cause further infections, like uh, what could have happened in the in the Wuhan on the market. They don't seem to contribute by a great deal. Environmental transmission was one of the keys, probably, of the original SARS-CoV-1 virus. So uh, it seems to be different in this case, mostly probably due to the different profile of uh, symptomaticity. So given these numbers, what we tried to do was uh, at least to infer one of the key quantities for epidemiology is the generation time distribution. So when you start being infectious and when you are most infectious with respect to the time after you got infected. Uh, this, this distribution is key to understand uh, uh, essentially the profile of infectiousness of different individuals. 
we were focusing on symptomatic ones because of course there is very little data on symptomatics and the environmental transmission is also is also pretty much unknown you can see in the in the right in the right plot uh, you can see the big uncertainty in the actual distribution of the generation time that is uh, so the, the the best fit is in blue by maximum composite likelihood and the uncertainty is in gray then the thing that is important to compare with is the incubation time uh, that is shown in red these, these are some old estimates by, uh, by Lauer et al the key that you get to observe is that if, if if you look at the left tail usually infectiousness starts before the onset of symptoms this is the key information because this means that uh, uh, quite some fraction of individuals will transmit presymptomatically this is uh, the uh, Bayesian reconstruction of presymptomatic transmissions for the few cases that we had that are about 40. So you can see in the, in the left plot, uh, the distribution of the posterior probability that these transmissions occur before of symptoms. And uh, the, the, average, the distribution of the average is shown on the right. And you see that uh, this is pretty much consistent between different reports, between 30 and 45% of all transmissions from symptomatic cases, from cases that will eventually become symptomatic, are actually presymptomatic transmissions. So presymptomatic transmissions seem to form a strong uh, part of the, of, of the total transmissivity of the virus. Now, if we go back to the classification, we try to fit this information into the infectiousness of the virus and, we, and to decompose it in the different terms by taking our best uh, knowledge about the different terms. And, uh, and, and their relevance, we end up with this decomposition. So this is the profile of infectiousness in time, where zero is the time the individual got infected. And you can see that uh, environmental asymptomatic transmission play a relatively minor role, but, uh, so, uh, but presymptomatic transmission plays a major role and essentially by itself, it will be almost able to drive the epidemic. This is a major issue, and this means that presymptomatic transmission should be stopped in order to control this epidemic. How to do that? The classical way to do this is contact tracing. So I, I, I find an individual that, that shows symptom. I try to trace his contacts before they go on causing further infections. Now, uh, if you are familiar with the classical renewal equation, the classical eula lot equation that, that, that uh, essentially gives you the uh, relation between R0 and uh, the growth rate with respect to omega of t, that is the generation time that we, we just computed. Uh, well, you can change these equations in order to account for contact tracing, given a given efficiency of isolation of cases and uh, tracing of contacts and quarantining of contacts. And the, the eula lot equation, becomes in this context a generalized functional equation in terms of the eigen uh, of the eigenvalue uh, the eigenvalue equation for the operator shown at the bottom this uh, tells you precisely which values of the of the are not uh, you are able to control with the contact tracing in this disease and these are the plots so the two parameters that you, that, that you see are uh, the success in isolating cases and the success in quarantining their contacts for different delays after the onset of symptoms. You can see that uh, there are, sorry, and the, line, the lines uh, uh, correspond to some typical values for this disease, uh, at least for the Chinese uh, epidemic, that is uh, 1.72 and 2.5. So you can see that uh, when you act immediately after onset of symptoms and you track contacts quite effectively, you can stop uh, the disease uh, even if R0 is up to four. So that is quite on the upper side of what are the constant, uh, the, the current estimates. But uh, if you wait for longer, essentially beyond 24 hours, you do not stop the disease uh, even if uh, it would ever uh, are not uh, in, on the lower end of what we believe it, it has. So the key thing is that you can stop this disease by contact tracing, but you have to be very, very fast. And the reason it matters is uh, shown here, essentially, that if you have a symptomatic case, if you wait a lot, essentially the 
you will get the wrong timing with respect to the other cases, in the sense that the contacts will have, will have already transmitted uh, by the time you find them. If uh, you have a very fast response in finding the contacts, you will be able to stop them uh, while the amount of transmission is still small. And that is pretty much the graph that summarizes our results. You need high efficiency, let's say order of 70% in both uh, isolating cases and quarantining contacts, and you, have you need very short response times. Why we thought about digital solutions? Because essentially the other tools uh, have uh, all other issues. For example, physical distancing and uh, isolation and quarantine are either insufficient or they carry a too high social and economic burden for the community. Classical mass screening testing and contact tracing is very hard to scale at large scale. You can do it locally, but it really requires huge amounts of people and huge capacity for testing to be scaled at, uh, at, at, at the level of a big epidemic in a country. And the vaccine, as you all know, is waiting for some time. So the digital technologies are pretty much the only one that are able to have a fast and scalable response. And the app works in the way that you will probably have heard. Essentially, when an individual has symptoms, uh, the app has recorded all its contacts in the, pre in the previous days, and it's just sending a signal of, uh, to, 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 his, to his contacts, uh, telling them, uh, look, you have been in, in touch with a, with, a, with, a, with a potential infected individual, please self-isolate for 14 days or seven days or whatever the policies. Um, this is something that uh, with different parameterizations can be used at any of the phases of the epidemic, can be useful initially to prevent the initial spread, can be used with very, very permissive parameters to have a smart lockdown to keep the economy afloat even when you have a large scale epidemic, because essentially you can tune the parameters to quarantine as many people as possible, but still you are essentially locking down only the, most, the people who are most at danger. It can be used for the, max, for the smart exit and with different parameters, it can be used to control the residual spread later. There are many challenges. This has, not, and has never been tested before to this, to this scale. Uh, the technology that has been uh, seen as the consensus one to, to do this kind of tracing at the distance of a few meters is Bluetooth low energy, uh, but there are limitations both in smartphone coverage and in the, in the amount of contacts that you are able to retrieve. The uptake at the level of the population should be really high. The, our, our simulations based on individual based models say that essentially 50% of the population, that means about 80% of the active population, ex excluding uh, elderly and children, should install the app and should comply with the, with the app actually. And of course, this, this should be coupled with diagnostics. So a scale up of the diagnostic capabilities is, uh, is needed. And furthermore, as you have seen, typically the, the kind of uh, epidemic that you can control as a not around 2.5. 2 Best estimates for Europe are a bit higher. So an extra degree of social distancing or some extra interventions could be needed. And what is crucial now is the process of improvement on the, of the back end and front end. So these, our, these results are just a proof of principle that the approach could work, but of course they do not optimize the algorithms or the, or the technology. There are certain issues, of course, if you want to have desired uptake on a voluntary base, you need to build a lot of trust and confidence. You need to be careful about privacy data usage and the algorithm should be made public and so on. And there are several categories of workers for which this uh, works in special ways, especially elderly healthcare workers uh, and uh, young courts. Uh, the app uh, could have quite a reasonable support. These are the, the numbers for the UK, where essentially most of the people would install the app if, uh, if, uh, if it would be available. Uh, the point is what uh, has to be done now. There's been a lot of discussion about the app, but what is missing is essentially working on it. So it's clear that app-based contact tracing could control the epidemic. It's probably the only ingredient that uh, has the potential to be so fast and so scalable, 
but uh, we do not have optimized contact tracing algorithms. We do not know how to learn with eventually from the contact networks that we, we could extract, uh, not at the scale that, uh, that, that has been done. And this is something, some place where machine learning could play a, a big role. We do not know how to learn uh, 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 um, epidemiological parameters to improve the app and so on. Moreover, the app alone would not work. It's too risky as an experiment. And right now it's not the time to experiment. So uh, they, it should be not stand alone, but should uh, work uh, as a part of an integrated strategy. So including epidemiological surveillance, risk forecast, hotspots uh, and their geolocalization and, and, uh, and uh, testing and tracing on hotspots, uh, possible local lockdowns. There are lots of questions about what is the interplay of these interventions and how can, how can each inform one another. The diagnostic testing is critical and physical distance is important. And this is some place where there's still a lot of support needed in terms of expertise and resources, especially at the European level. And then uh, please find out more information if you want on uh, on our web page, there will be an individual based model that will be released soon publicly for everyone to use and evaluate different interventions, including the app. And uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention.